during the Japanese okay. occupation. We're rolling. Yeah. So we were living on Taft Avenue, and Carmen and Lulu and Pota were in one house. We were in the next house. And then we had a, uh, at the back was the neighbor separated by a wall. And that wall was our, not a backyard, but like a small back patio, you know, the apartments before didn't have a garden. It's just a small patio and the kitchen. And the bathroom in the kitchen had a swinging shutter door, you know, where the it's yeah. like a it's yeah. like the bar room. Yeah, it's yeah, it's similar, similar to that one. Uh -huh. It's open in the bottom. Mm -hmm. So we were there, Lulu, I, and Potai, and uh, suddenly this chicken flies in from the neighbor's house. <laughs> Lulu, chicken, grab it. <laughs> you know, Lulu. Yeah, let's grab it. Oh, wow, we were already thinking fried chicken. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> fried chicken. You know, Japanese time, <laughs> it was scarce. <laughs> Food was very scarce. So uh -huh. we're thinking of so, the wow. fried chicken and, okay, grab it. And we were, we were holding on to it. And the neighbor comes around, you know, from the back, he uh -huh. comes around. Did a chicken fly in here? <laughs> <laughs> and we throw the chicken inside the bathroom. But of course the door, you know, it's open. <laughs> and Lulu said, you know how Lulu is. No. Chicken? No, we didn't see any chicken. And I was already getting, mm, what am I going to do? Mm, just keep quiet. No, no, chicken came in here. And that stupid chicken from the bottom, he goes, cock, 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 cock. That's our chicken, you, you thieving mistisa. I go, mistisa is half breed, you know. Mistisa magnanaka. <laughs> This close to him. Who are you calling Magnanaka? <laughs> we don't know how the chicken got in here. This is the first time I see this chicken. Here, take your chicken. You know? <laughs> after, after he left, we were laughing. <laughs> and then both I goes, you know, I had a crush on him yet. <laughs> but forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody had that chicken. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I sent that story to the Mercury News and they printed it. They did? <laughs> yeah. Oh. I sent it to <laughs> And they asked him, yeah. they asked him. But they for called it. me up. Uh, Where is this lady? It, it's all right with that lady to print. Oh, yeah, you can print. She's in Australia. She, and she'll get a kick out of it. I said, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Bold facedly. You know, I said, nothing happened. They put the chicken on the lady. They're still denying it. What thieves? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's Lulu. That's Lulu. Eh? I'll tell crazy. you a story about the cigarettes. Well, anyway, that was well. That anyway, we we'll talk into... about Japanese time. Oh yeah, that's the, the more or less. It's yeah, more yeah. life was normal, except that there was a scarcity of food. Rice was hard to come by. The Japanese confiscated all the all the rice production. Well, Manolo told me that he. He actually had a job over at the Hialeah. Who is in this? The sky room. Oh, I don't know. And so it seemed like people had jobs, and you could still, even there though you're being paid Mickey Mouse money, you still were being paid some yeah. kind of money. Yeah. So there was a semblance of yeah. normalcy. Yeah. Some Business. Kind. There, there was because there was a puppet government. There was a puppet yeah. government under Laurel. President Laurel. We were Laurel. given. We were even given an independence. There was independence day on. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, given by the Japanese, you know. We were, of course, it's Mickey Mouse independence, too. And anyway, uh, there were no more movies, because we were not importing any more movies. The last movie, uh, I remember the last movie that I saw, and I think it's the last movie that ever was imported to the Philippines, was Sun Valley mm -hmm. Serenade, you know, with John Payne and Son Jahini. It happened in San Valley not so very long ago. Yeah, I remember that song. <laughs> Why do Robin sing in December? And they showed that over. I think I went to see it ten times oh. during the Japanese time. Uh -huh. It was a beautiful movie too, and that's where they played in the moon. The original it was played there. So we were 
But there, so there were normal movies. Were there propaganda, Japanese propaganda movies that they would show? Films? Yeah, there would be once in a while. Not really. Not much, really. Not much. Uh, they left us to ourselves, more or less. I mean, unless you're caught with At that time, doing some... Everything was still pretty yeah. normal. Yeah, this was just shows. from 1942 up to about 19... 43 was all right. Still, everything was more or less normal. Uh, kids were going to school. I did not go to school anymore because my father didn't want the idea of me going to school. Because when I, before going to school, I had to pass to a Japanese garrison. See, part of our school became the Japanese garrison. So be, before going to the school, we had to pass by the sentry. And everybody has to bow down. And my father didn't like the idea of us bowing down. And he, he just didn't like the idea, so he told me, don't, don't go anymore to school. So for three years, my schooling was suspended. I think Charito also. And so that's what happened. Were and, the uh, trans was the transportation still running? Oh, yeah, there was. They had Ipopi, you know. The name of the, there was a bus. We were in San Juan then, and there was a charcoal-fed buses. Charcoal-fed. And the name, you know, the funny name is this. The name of the bus is Ipopi, I-P-O-P-I. -P -P -I. And then its logo was Ipopi, and underneath it says Ipopi, spelled backwards is Ipopi. <laughs> nice. We would write and we would look at that, and then the stupid, <laughs> they had to remind us. A poppy is spelled backward, is a poppy. <laughs> <laughs> That's their logo. <laughs> this is but crazy. The street cars then, they removed already all the seats. It was like a cattle car. Oh. Yeah. And everybody was standing. Standing room only. Standing. Yeah. No more seats. And then you Just were talking so you about the. Uh, more and more people in. The Kalesas and the Dokars. The uh, Dokar, yeah. yeah. The Dokar was the Cadillac. Yeah, that had uh, automobile tires. And it had a cart just like the Kalesa, but yeah. it was pulled by oh, a yeah, horse. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's elaborate. It's yeah, ornate, it's very ornate. Very huh? ornate. <laughs> it's like one of those state coaches. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. But low. It's, it's not high. It's low. Low. Yeah, and then pulled by a horse. <laughs> so, no, what, so you had a normal, I guess, quote unquote, life. Yeah. For a while, until, until I understand the until, Japanese started uh, losing. And what happened was started. this. Uh, yeah. uh, 1944. September. The first air raid was September 21, right? Yeah. The first, you know, before September 1944, earlier that year, every morning you would see the Japanese planes practice dogfight. They would go dogfight maneuvers. Every morning, and we, we were kids, we look around, look at the spray. See them. Every morning, you see them. Then one day, September 21, we were looking at that one, and then we saw, look at that. The plane's going down. Boy, <laughs> there were the American planes already. They thought they were still practicing, and the oh. Americans came in. Oh, boy, they really caught them flat footed. Mm. And that's when, boy, Manila was, well, we, we were bombed. Uh, all of Manila Bay, all the Japanese ships oh, in Manila wow. Bay was sunk. Oh, really? Oh. Yes, and the uh, Central Bank was bombed. There were a lot of casualties, I remember that. Because I was in the hospital then. Why were you in the hospital? My, my father was in the hospital. And so after the first air raid, then, you know, there was a lot of anti-aircraft fire from the Japanese, and uh, a lot of stray bullets and shrapnels around. And that's when I saw the wounded come into the hospital. They were bringing so many people wounded. Back up a little bit and tell me, why was your father in the hospital? Uh, he was, during the Japanese time, at that time my father was arrested by the Japanese. And uh, they thought that MacArthur, well, this is what Harada told us, no? What's his name, no? Fujihara? I forgot the name. Well, anyway, it's an, this is another story. Huh? My father was arrested by the Japanese in 1943. No, May, May 1944, somewhere there. 
May or April 1944, and uh, he disappeared, and we didn't know where he was. There was, uh, that was one week where I saw my mother's hair turn from black to white in one week, because we didn't know where my father was. He just disappeared out of the blue. And so we started asking, asking, asking. And then we finally find out they brought him to the Navy Fort Santiago. And he was there. And it's a good thing, like, you know, at that time there were, there were Filipinos working there. And one of them was uh, with the guerrillas too. And he was the one who came to us and told us, your father your, is in, at the Gaspi Landing, and he's one of those incarcerated. And he told us, told me to come here. Okay. And they were asking, "Who are you?" He says, "Just keep this quiet because I'm I'm at risk here. You know, I'm a guerrilla, but I'm working inside, so he knows." But then he said, "Even this Filipino said, you know, your father is lucky because this Fujihara, Fujihara by his name. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember." He's a good Japanese. He's a really good Japanese. And Fujihara was, was who? Was he in charge of Yes, Fort he was Santiago? in charge, kind of. You've heard of Fort Santiago. Fort yes. Santiago. Uh -huh. He was one of those. He was a Kampitai. And he was only 21 at that time. And you know, the, the funny thing is this, after the war, this was in the 70s, he, he, he got in touch with me. And he said, I, I, I'm Fujihara, I was there. And my father, when, when my father was released from Fort Santiago, already told us, you know, if there is any Japanese you have to save, you have to save Fujihara. Really? He's a good man. So and he even that guerrilla, that he guerrilla. Wasn't, he would, your father wasn't mistreated in Fort Santiago? Yeah. He was not mistreated? Or he oh, was? he was. That's why he, they, he hit him with a chair at the back, you know, and some of the, this, you know, that big yell. Uh, Yale padlock, that big, big one, they hit him here in the head. And so, and that's what my father said, you know, they were in the room about smaller than this, a very small room, maybe three by three, three by three meters, and there were about 25 of them. And he said, every night one of them would die from suffocation. Because they sleep one over the other. Because my father was the oldest, they always let him put him on the top. You know, the prisoners there. He let Mr. Opus stay on the top. And my father told us well, after he was released, he said, You know, I owe it to that Japanese that Fujihara is a good man. Whatever happens, I hope something happens. Well, anyway, years have passed. We've forgotten all about it. And then this Filipino guerrilla got, got in touch with us. Forgot his name. I don't know why I should forget the name. When he was, he played a very important role. He said, "Mr. Obus, you remember me?" Oh, I said, "Yeah, you used to bring the food to my father." Yeah, he said, "Yeah, you know Fujihara is in town." Oh yeah, yeah, and he'd like to meet with you. So he had dinner at home. Invited him to the house. Hmm. We even had a picture with him, you know, with the picture of my father. This was in Manila. Yeah. At our house in San Juan. We had him and met him. Nothing, we just said hello. And she finally asked, Now, Fujihara, why did you arrest my father in law? <laughs> yes, they never knew why he was we arrested. We never knew. So, and he said, and You know, this has always been a mystery. Why was he arrested? And, and he, they mistook him for a spy or something? No, no. They, they thought that MacArthur, you know, you're, I was a young Kempitai. When you're in the Kempitai, when you're in the Secret Service, any, any rumor. small rumor you try to verify. You know? So, you know, but I respected your father because he was a very well-known congressman and uh, he was very popular. And so I got the information that you just cannot you know, you have to be nice to him. So I went there in civilian clothes. And I told him, uh, if you don't mind, Mr. Opus, 
I'd like to take you with me. And my father, instead of going with me, he yelled at me, you know. <laughs> he yelled at me. So I got mad. I took him in. Arrested him. Yeah. And arrested him. And, uh, you know, they tried to, I don't know. But anyway, he was released later on. Because he said, no, I, MacArthur never, never got in touch with MacArthur. The rumor was that he, MacArthur appointed him governor of our, of our province, which never happened, I think. So anyway. Did your father survive the war? Oh, yeah. But he died shortly thereafter. I mean, he was not able to recover from that. He had to. And uh, also because of the suspicion, because he, he, he just guaranteed so many ex-soldiers. The soldiers who came from the Visayas, you know. My father said, look, we have to guarantee I'm the only Visayas there. And they could not run to anybody else but me. Something like that. Anyway, finally he was released. And we met Fujihara. He was a nice guy. And uh, well, for good reason, I think my father told, told us to be nice to him. That's the reason your father was in the hospital from his beating he took at Port Santiago. Well, then he yeah. suffered. Then uh, he his suffered. Heart, his heart. Know, and he got complications a complication. Yeah, by September he died the next year, 1945. Now, at this 46, time. 46, 46, 46. September 45. Bro. At this time, you were still able to go see your father it, at yeah, Santa Tomas. Santa Tomas, no more. Well, 44, oh, they cut it. Uh, we went to, I would go to Santo Tomas and uh, very, very strict under, uh, the guards were there watching everything, you know. We could talk to him, we, we could still talk to him. So we went there and I would bring... Through the fence? No. How would you talk to him? It was like an enclosure, but everybody was mixed up there. So, I, and then I said, Daddy, we have some food here for you, some donuts or whatever. I give it to me and then he would put it inside his shirt, you know? And nobody was looking. So that's but that was already the extreme. That Japanese Nisei guy was there. And he said, Do it fast, do it fast, you know. Oh but so he after would let that, you do that. Yeah, after a few weeks no more. Yeah, completely mm. closed already. We couldn't visit anymore. When You'd be the surprised though that not not just, I don't think oh I don't think all the Japanese were bad really. I mean just like any human like that. Like uh, Fujihara for instance could be an exception, you know? I don't know why. But they were telling us that that Japanese was like an undercover. Undercover, was, could be. Working for the Americans, but of course like a when was the last time you saw your father then? Oh, the last time? The last time I remember when he was in those dormitory, the classrooms that faced the street, and somebody told us, gave us a note from him that he would be at that window at such and such a time. So we went there. We just waited, and then finally he showed up. And we just waved. That was it. That's it. Yeah. So, and what maybe a couple of times we did that, and then after that, no more. Incomunicado. No visitors, no food, no nothing. And we knew that the internees were having a hard time already because the Americans were getting closer and closer and closer. And yeah. We were hearing all this. It and became I, harder and harder as the Americans approached. Short wave, you know, my uncle was had the short wave radio and. My, uh, they're in Lingayen, they're in Leyte. All of them, we were, we were all there. And then we would see Japanese coming, so we would run to my uncle. Janesto, Janesto, they're Japanese, Japanese are coming. Shut up, don't make noise, I cannot hear. And you do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we would go out and play. <laughs> it was scary, but uh, it was, after that first air raid, then things started to go really bad. I mean, oh, yeah. after yeah, the first air raid, wow. that was uh, September, and then... They would stop you on the street and inspect whatever you were bringing. Just you know, about just before Christmas, before Christmas, the Japanese confiscated 
the lower portion of our house. You know, we had two stories. So they, they confiscated the ground, and that's where they stored the gasoline. And some of them were living there. My father said, what the hell are we doing here? I mean, you know, it's just too dangerous. So I don't know, at that time, too, we were hard up already. My father just sold the house, you know? And I said, forget it. And we, we left. We went back to San Mateo. And that's where we brought everything that we had. We brought it to San Mateo. How did you, if there was no more gasoline and no more trucks, oh, how we did were you bring Calesa, all Calesa and pushcarts. We, we hired people on pushcarts. Or, yeah, all that thing. Uh, but somehow you can manage. And, uh, well, we brought whatever we could, not everything, you know. And uh, anyway, we went back to San Mateo. Maybe that was a bigger mistake, but, but then you would not feel comfortable living with the Japanese, would you? Why do you say that might have been a bigger mistake? Because we were hit directly by the Americans, you know. You know, when we, when we were being liberated by the Americans, like I said, during a war. That's why I don't know why America right now has to be careful about collateral damage to these Iraqis. Who cares about There's a war going on, you civilian. You, they were firing at us, civilians. We didn't care. That's part of the war. A lot of Filipinos were killed because of friendly fire from Americans. Our house was hit by the house we were living in, San Mateo. Three big gaping holes on the roof. Wow. Nobody got hurt? Well, the only one who was hurt was that Kolaiko. He was standing beside me and he was hit. And I remember, I'm here. Because this is the stable, you know, the stable is made of concrete, really. One of those old Spanish fort type concrete, you know. No, not concrete, what do you call adobe. this? Adobe, but really thick maybe 10, 10 feet deep, and, and that was the air raid shelter for the neighborhood. When, the, when there was a call for air raid, when there was an air raid warning, because you would hear the Japanese would be on the belfry of the church. There was a sentry, Hikoki, that means airplane. When we hear Hikoki, that means everybody, boy, you better go. And all the neighborhood would run into that stable. But my sister and I were, we were, we just enjoyed watching the air raid, you know. The air raid or the dog fight, or, the dog fight or whatever. We, we would not go down and watch from the kitchen, you know. And uh, until we saw the tree being hit by a bomb, boom. And <laughs> that's when we ran down, when we ran down, the stable was full of evacuees, of uh, what you call these civilians, no? Uh, f the whole air raid shelter was filled up. You know, when you're in a desperate situation, you just stand right next to the door, and that's your security blanket, you know? At least I'm next to the security. And I was standing here, my sister was here, and Kolaiko was there, okay? Oh no, my sister was here, she was closest to the door. I was here, this, my sister, and then Kolaiko was there. And then my sister looked at her foot, she, she was crying. I've been hit, I've been hit, no. There was blood on her legs. I said, you move your legs, see if you're painful. Yeah, but they say when you're hit, you won't feel anything. I don't feel anything, I've been hit. Then I look at my legs, it has all the blood, you know. Then at the time I realized Kolaiko was hit. He was hit on the thigh and it was his blood that squirted. And like a good citizen, I just let him slide down. <laughs> <laughs> he was in a pool of blood. And he was able to survive that, though. <laughs> but I was, I was scared. And uh, he was the only one who was hurt. But as we went up, everything was destroyed. You were telling me at one, one point that you could 
by hearing the engines on the oh, yeah. airplanes, yeah. you could tell you which know. one yeah. was yeah. Japanese. The Japanese engine. You would know the Japanese. The Japanese. Oh, 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 oh. And we knew. We could tell right away. Americans. So when we saw it, then the silver. It's a steady roar. Glints. Mm. Ooh, oh, it's nice. Here, here, we would run and, <coughs> and you know, we can run inside the house because we knew there would be a dog fight, and we were right. Lourdes was here. That's Dewey Boulevard, you know, and that's where they would over the bay. Fights, over yeah. the bay, yeah, they would uh, dog fight and oh, then bomb the ships. From from that was from October, about October when they landed in Lingayen, or October until February. Every day, yeah. there was dog fights and bombing. You know, we we were our house, the house we were living in in San Mateo was two stories. Some of those airplanes, I think they were the A26, they would go down solo. We would call them grass cutters. You know, as kids, we were inventing names. Hey, look at those grass cutters! They go down from the second floor. What we could see was the top was the tower, you know, it would, and then they would go over the, because this is San Mateo, and that is Bayan Bayana, that's Marikina, and that's where the Japanese airfield was. And every day, the, the place would come from here, go down here, and every day they were being bombed. And the, those planes, the planes would go solo, that when they drop, they would drop uh, with parachutes. The bomb would come down with parachutes, you know, otherwise they, they, they get hit. And some of them, I think, are timed so that even at midnight, you hear the bombs exploding <laughs> inside the camp. The camp is about two miles, three miles away. We could see. We, we had fun. We, it was nice when you see those. And then one morning, the, there was a big, you know, usually it would, be, it would involve at most six planes. <coughs> Raiding that airfield, but one morning I think they just went blind bombing. Boy, the Americans went crazy. I don't know how many planes were there, but they were all over. And uh, that was the next day. I, you know, it is hard for me to imagine that I cried for a Japanese. You know, the Japanese were all the next day after that big air raid. Because there was a station hospital in San Mateo. Our house was about less than a block away from the station hospital. And there were so many wounded Japanese out, so many, that both sides of the street were lined up with soldiers in stretchers. And some of them only on blankets, you know, cut off limbs, wounded, and nobody attending to them. And I had to go and buy some things. And when I saw them, you know, then you realize they're human after all. You know, they were crying. You know, I cried. I cried when I, you know, instead of being happy, hey, son of a bitches, but I cried because I saw they were human suffering too. They were suffering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I cried. You know, I couldn't believe that. It was hard for me to believe that. I will shed a tear for them. And there was <laughs> hatred, but did Butch tell you about our when we left uh, Pasay to go to my uncle's in San Francisco del Monte? No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Did she? she did. Mm -hmm. Oh. When we left that because we had no more nothing to eat, we had no rice. So my mother said, "Okay, let's go to your uncle's, San Francisco del Monte, and we'll get some food there." So Carmen Moreno, Carmen Rabago. Me, Butch, and my mother, the four of us, we left 8 o'clock in the morning and we walk, 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 walk all the way to San Francisco del Monte and we, by 5 o'clock, we were in Blumen Street, which is a crossroads already, you know. This is Blumen Street and then there is a highway <laughs> here going to San Francisco del Monte. To, so we weren't there yet, but we stopped there and we rested and we had, you know, bread and stuff. And had we stayed there one hour more, 
or half an hour more, the American, the, what is it, First Cavalry? First, first Cavalry. First Cavalry was, we would have welcomed them in. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh. yeah. And we had, we didn't meet any Japanese or, of course, because, it's, and my mother they was were strange. They we were We were lucky. We haven't seen any Japanese, you know? So then we went on to my uncle's and we got there like five o'clock in the afternoon. So from eight to five, we just walked. We walked to my uncle's. And when we got there, of course, we were young kids and we were jumping and running and my mother was just walk, walk, walk. We got there and the sky was red. Yeah, Manila was and red. Red, red. We were wondering what's going on. And then people started coming. The Americans, they're in Manila. And we started to cry, you know, because Wow, I said, we were right there in the corner. And my mother said, we were right there. How can, we never saw any American. No, they're there, they're there, they're in the market, they're in, in Manila. And we saw the sky all red. And oh, let's go home, let's go home. My uncle said, you're crazy, you're not going home now. You cannot go home. And my uncle also was being helped by a Japanese soldier who would bring them rice, you know, he would help them. And they harbored this guy this japanese was in one of the rooms and nobody knew and the neighbors came all excited and my, my aunt his wife you know she said if you had a good japanese she would tell ask the neighbors because they didn't know what to do with him if you had a good japanese friend who would help you and he came to you for help now what would you do a Japanese is a Japanese. <laughs> we're going to kill him. We're going to tear him apart. We're going to kill him and mince him. And... Oh, my God. <laughs> she was she said, did you hear what they said? Oh, my God. What are we going to do? So finally, they had to give him up. They gave him up to the guerrillas. And the Japanese would rather surrender to the U.S. To the U.S. Army, not to, not to the not guerrillas. To what happened to this? What, they would be skinned alive. No. Oh, my God. The guerrillas, they, they get, get you. They away, and we don't know what happened to him, but. Hey. <laughs> and, uh, but a Japanese is a Japanese thing. Yeah, that was uh, a time when it was exciting for us. As I was 14. And you know, uh, at about that time in San Mateo, the planes would fly over. A Piper Cub would fly over and they would drop leaflets. You would know if they're leaflets because they'd flow, the, the wind would blow them. Huh? They'd fly sideways like that. And nobody cared about the leaflets, you know. What is that? But when it, they drop things and it doesn't go that way, but it goes straight down. You know, there were cigarettes. <laughs> Four to a pack, and it says, I shall return, General <laughs> MacArthur. <laughs> and that's how I tell my friends. That's how I learned it. General MacArthur taught me how to smoke. <laughs> we would run after that and, you know, gather as much as we can and take some to my father and then smoke some to ourselves. I mean, little knowing that when it says, I shall return, you were going to return for more cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> after we were liberated. American so, marketing. American marketing, that we had to buy it already. Oh, boy. But that was it. And then the other one was the civilian. Um, make way for the fighting men. Make way for the fighting men. Get out of the something war zone. And then, or there was another one when civilians were, wear your best Sunday suits, you know, white. Oh, really? So, so that, they could uh, recognize uh, you? During the air raid, then we were, one instructed us to go to the middle of the rice field. So, so we won't be hit by, by the bombs mm -hmm. or the shelling, you know. And uh, so we would do that. And uh, so it was exciting. Every day, every day there was an air raid. Did you ever come back to Manila after Santa, uh, San Mateo? Yeah, after San Mateo, we finally, Ma Manila was already liberated. Oh, OK. Yeah. Uh, because, oh. OK. Yesterday, Bujit was telling us a story about when you had the um, restaurant with your mother the coffee shop, yeah, and there was a mechanic shop across the street yeah, from yeah. you, and a truckload of soldiers came in and yep. POWs. 
Yeah, and, yeah. Where, and where were the POWs from? Do you recall? I don't recall, but... Uh, can you relate that story the best you can remember it? A whole, yeah, it was a truckload. And they all came down, and they wanted to use the bathroom. So, of course, my mother, oh, the bathroom is in there. And I think those guards, you know, the Japanese guards, were liberal enough to understand that, hey, they didn't follow them to the bathroom, you know. I guess they knew that once in the kitchen, then we were giving them all kinds of food, and they were stuffing it into their into the shirts, you know, and my mother had uh, omelette because she would make omelette with fried rice inside and she would just wrap it in, in uh, paper and then they would stuff that all. And the Japanese never came in to see that, you know, so we were all, and they were all so thin and, but that's, and after that they were loaded into their trucks and you didn't and had, did you have a chance to talk to them at all i i don't remember no. i don't think so i think I, we were so scared because the japanese were there oh my god soldiers oh well, you know prisoners of war yeah, my, my my birthday was liberation was uh the first thing when we came back from san francisco del monte was of course to go to santo tomas because then after that exchange of uh when the guards were, when the Japanese were escorted to their lines. And then, of course, it was open already. So we went there. I don't know why. I was the only one who went. And I looked, no, we looked for my father. And they told us that they had been evacuated to an a evacuation hospital, which was the Quezon Institute. Quezon Institute was then the... Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis Center. Center, yeah. But then it was a hospital, not, and all the evacuees were there, those who needed hospitalization. And so we found out that he was there. And when I went next day, we went to see him, and he was already, he lost, well, Butch must have told you, he lost like 80 pounds, something like that. He was already in bed. And he was, oh, mommy, mommy, he was so glad to see us. And daddy, wow, he was so thin. And then that night, I stayed with him. And my mother and Butch went home. And the next day, so I, they gave me a cot there. I slept there. And then the next day, when I went to look for him again, he had already died that night. Mm -hmm. So it's like he just waited to see us. So I was alone there in the hospital because mom and Butch had gone home. Did you have a chance to talk to him while you were alone there with him? No, I wasn't. They, they wouldn't let me stay there with him throughout the night. So I slept in the hospital. I had a cot there or something. And then the next morning, I went early to see him again, and they told me that he had passed away that night. Is that when... When you went to go visit him, is that when he gave you the little diary entries that that you got? No. How did you get I a hold of that? I think he had. How did we get that? I think he had. Uh, they gave it to me with some of his belongings. Yeah. No. And that's how we got it. Because after he died, then they assigned a, a soldier to me to, to take him wherever, you know. Ma they made arrangements for the funeral, for burial, everything. And I was just riding with that soldier the whole time, and he was, until we went to the funeral parlor. And it was just a rough pine, you know, box. How old were you at the time? I was... 15, 14, 15, yeah. Because we were all then herded in one house in my uncle's house, which burned. So we had to run to another relative's house and we were all there like this here and everybody was on the floor sleeping. And then after that they found another house and we were all banded together with my uncle. And, and mom was like, 
taking care of everybody, and we were all trying to get our lives together. Yeah, Which, I guess that's what happened during the Japanese time. All the relatives became closer, you know. We shared house with some other relatives. Uh, that, that, that's what happened. And then uh, with us, what happened was in San Mateo, <coughs> well, in San Mateo, finally we we were, get, we were able to get out of San Mateo. And we crossed, we, we went over to San Francisco del Monte, walking. And uh, that was hard because we had no food. I remember along the way we, we saw some tomato gardens, you know, and the tomatoes were green. We were teenagers, and my friends and I. We just saw those green tomatoes, we ate it. <laughs> I don't know how, how can I cannot imagine myself. But we ate that tomato. We ate those tomatoes. But uh, it was green. Butch was telling me about the uh, one time when they were hiding my grandmother. Oh, yeah, in, in Malate. Malate, yes. Mm, uh, because it was already very critical at that time. And your mom was nine months pregnant. So your dad said, we have to save you and the baby. We cannot bring uh, your grandmother because she was paralyzed. You know, half her body was paralyzed. So what they did, they put her in Malati church and they covered her with uh, galvanized iron. And then your dad and your mom, they, they had to run for their lives. They, he was saving her because she was pregnant. You, so they were able to, and then after liberation, after everything had been, had quieted down, we went back and we went from Red Cross unit to Red Cross unit looking for her. And we found her and she was fine. And they had bombed Malate Church. You know, it was all shattered. But somehow she survived, and we found her in a Red Cross hospital. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh. And she was And fine. she was fine? She was fine. I don't know where Tochin was. I don't know either. He wasn't with them? No, he was living there, but I don't know, somehow. But he was working, so maybe he was at work, or anyway, it was, yeah. Because Carlota didn't want to leave her mother, but Gopal said, no, I've got to look after you and the baby, so. I read about quite a few, during that time, quite a few atrocities that happened. Oh, oh yeah. Like, the oh. Japanese would throw gasoline inside of it's house. Paco Church. Yeah. Turn all of them. Yeah. Paco Church, yeah. Ermita Church, Malate Church, no, Malate, no. Paco, Ermita, uh, Manila Cathedral. Yeah. Intramuros was... S San Agustin. Bombed out. No, no, San Agustin was spared. No, San, San Agustin still... Was spared, yeah. Uh, Intramuros was bombed out completely, including the cathedral. You know, St. Paul uh, College, where I used to study... Well, there were mass atrocities. There was an auditorium there, and they herded a lot of people inside the auditorium. They wired the auditorium and blew it up. And one of the survivors is Butch's classmate. She lost her left arm, her left eye, and then, but she survived. No, she was, she's a survivor. Oh, she was a fighter. She was a fighter. Girl. And she, then she died. after she graduated, she learned to play the piano with one, hand, Huko, with one hand. Huh? And she grew up to be a congresswoman. A good teacher too, a very good oh, teacher. Yeah. She was, she was part of our never, gang before. You know, and at that in, time there was no prosthesis or anything, so she was just. In college, there. in college, we, we, we. She was part of our group, uh, Estelita Hulk. Malate Hulko. people are massacred there. We know Malate, families, whole families. The Rizal Memorial Stadium, the same thing. Mass massacre. I have read about yeah. the German club where they threw gasoline inside yeah. and burned everybody up. And these were Germans, supposedly allies of the Japanese. Uh, Did you know anyone that was involved in, or died because of any of these atrocities? 
Yeah. I know some. Yeah. Really? I mean, you know. Garrett's I... sons were our class, were our playmates. They were Alice, Margaret. There were three girls, and their mother, and they were all killed by Japanese. And then along Mabini, Mabini Street, there were a lot of mestizo families there. And they were all killed. Massacred completely. And my families. My aunt, my uncle. My aunt, you know, uh, she's the wife of my mother's brother. She, her mother, like I told you, there's a street, and there are Americans here and Japanese here. And she tried to cross the street to go to the other side. She was shot dead. And her daughter just held up her hands like that, and they didn't shoot her because she picked up the mother. A lot of them. Uh, Paco, Paco Church completely burned down too. Oh, yeah. The same Paco, thing. Paco. They herded all the people in there and burned oh, it. Oh, Lulu and, and the king with Kiting. Oh, Kiting arrived. They arrived in, they were in Paco. And they Paco. went to a movie house for shelter and they burned that, so they had to run. And then they went back to the burned out. Yeah, because they said, you know, it's burned out already. They won't come back here. So they hid there. And there was a bunch of them. And then in Manila, uh, north and south, in Santa Mesa, they built, because all the bridges were bombed. There was no, it was completely cut off, north and south. So in Nagtahan, they built the pontoon bridge. Pontoon bridge. That was the only connecting that bridge. That was the only connection. North, north and south. south. So we were all there waiting because all the evacuees were streaming in, you know, the, those who were surviving. And then we saw, that's where we saw Lulu and Enrique. Kiting was like matted hair, you know. He was in Lulu's arms, yeah. He was all... The three of them were just unbelievable, you know, how they survived that. Mm. If you ever get to talk to Lulu, she can give you good mm -hmm. stories many, about liberation. You, you, you. How many days uh, were Lou's father and mother running in this situation? I don't running know. Running for I their know. lives? No, they left before that massacre occurred because I guess they knew what was coming. So while they had a chance to go, they left. She was, she was ready. When were you born? March? April. April. April 2nd. February, imagine. In seven months, yeah. yeah. You know, you, you, if you go to San Agustin Church, then you will see the niches there. Wholesale, families. Mm -hmm. Names of families. 1945. 1945. A friend of mine, Chicote, Tony Chicote. Now they still have that there? Yeah. Can I? Oh, yes. Take it's uh, San Agustin Church. You can see them there. We're almost done here. Yeah. Was there anything that I might have forgotten to ask you, or maybe at the tail end you wanted to say how you know things happened to you, or did you? One thing I always ask is, was there something that you found in yourself, some inner strength that made you? survive the war that you somehow you've also used in later on challenges later on in your life as a challenge overcome well, that challenge the liberation was a beautiful day yeah, I guess. you know i guess so that you that, up, got you that alone up, you know? you that experience of being free yeah. of being liberated again and then you know uh well one thing i know is when i see these horror pictures now of war that Martin, everybody gets, oh, horrible. How does that affect you, Mom? You know, Martin, I've seen that. You know, in I, real I've life. gone through we that. We went through that, you so, know? Killing fields. Well, yeah, killing fields. And they say, oh, no, that's Hollywood. No. no it's not Hollywood. It's not Hollywood. That's how it happened. That's, that's how, how it happened. happened. The fields, the rice fields. And the smell. The people there. And then and the, the smell, smell of death. Of burning bodies. And the smell of death. It's and in the market. <laughs> In the market once, we went to the market, and they caught this Japanese. They had him strung up feet, 
his feet up like that and slit all the way and all his entrails out like that and Chabeng, you remember Chabeng? Mm -hmm. Chabeng and I and then I think or somebody, we were in the market and we saw that and we were just, and Chabeng went, oh, she couldn't eat anymore. And we were just, wow. We were looking at it like, we had seen so many atrocities already that to me it was just another atrocity, you know? So we went home that night and the others couldn't eat, but the rest of us, you don't want your salad, you give it to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Like You're that. just numb to the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. And then there was that smell, the smell of the smell. dead bodies. Uh, we'd been there for two, three, four and days. Piled up like as like, high as you know, this. In, yeah. front, in front of Far Eastern Japanese University. Oh, yeah. Boy, a yeah, mountain, a mountain full of Japanese. I remember that. They yeah. just put them all there, I think, burned them all. Burned them. Just burned. Wow. But the smell is really bad. No, it wasn't bad. Oh, well, it when was when a you strange don't... smell, but it yeah, wasn't. But it's it was like, bad. Like, uh, rotten. No. To me, yeah. It's like sometimes I smell that, you know, and I'm looking around. What is, where does that come from? It, it brings back that smell. Mm -hmm. I don't forget that. My birthday, February 13th. Everything was destroyed, everything was burned up, and my God, Manila, I think you could stand on one side and look all the way across, everything was leveled. I've seen pictures of Manila south of the Pasig, yeah. and yeah. it looked like... Level. Raised. Looked like Hiroshima had, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then north, there wasn't that much rubble, was there? Was there no, da uh, much north, damage? There was, there, was, there was damage was Escolta. Escolta and Rizal Avenue. Not even Rizal Avenue. No, Rizal Escolta Avenue. was the one. Was. Escolta. But all the bridges had been blown. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, a friend of mine, a fellow Rotarian, later on. I mean, I'll just tell you this little story because this is people making money out from the difficulties of war, you know. This Senon, Senon Aguila. Uh, before the war, he was unschooled. He didn't go to high school. All, he was a glass cutter. His job was, he was a young boy cutting glasses, you know, to make into mirrors. And that was his job. Uh, so Japanese time, he said, I got married. I was a young teenager. I married my wife. And uh, so we, we tried hard. There was not too much work. But when the liberation came, I saw Escolta. Escolta was really, boy, blown to pieces. And I saw all those burned glasses. And he told his wife, come on. He made himself a cart, picked up all those little bits and pieces of glasses, go home, cut them into, he said, there would be no supply of mirrors for years. Boy, and he was the only source of mirrors, you know. Oh, he was the only one thought cut of it. That, I tell you, he became a multimillionaire. Aguila Glass Company. He was selling to, you, by golly, his house. His huge house with two big eagles in front. I remember Aguila. Wow, and he said, you know, that was the good thing. He said, if without that, I would still be cutting glass. <laughs> hey, your father started with a bottle of whiskey. Yeah, he bought he did. a bottle of whiskey. He sold that, he bought more, and pretty soon, he had a nightclub, and then I was working in that nightclub as a cashier. That was the Bluebird. The Bluebird. 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 Yeah, I was working there. When as a when cashier. was that? That but was after. Mom after? said no. I don't want you working there. <laughs> was that you know? after uh, liberation? Oh yeah, after oh. liberation. Already. And you know, the ones who would pick me up were sailors who would come to the house because <laughs> everybody would come to that house in Gastambide. That picture of you and Budget with two sailors? <laughs> yeah. Is that at, at the Bluebird? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I don't have that picture. She's got it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah it was I should have taken a picture Joe, of that. Joe, what's his name? Joe something. He was, you know, he would take care of us. And Mom, Joe, can you go and pick up Charito? And, you know, oh, 
sure, Mom. You know, they would just, they would show up there. Nobody could touch us. They would just stand there. It was really. Then jump when, when the Americans came, they brought with them sardines. Oh boy, and we were all hungry, huh? Can you just imagine what sardines was? Just like lobster. Wow. <laughs> and they had a pico. Uh, Philippine civilian uh, something emergency. Pico, this is a they you go there, you you are assigned a pico station for you. If you live here, you go to this pico station. Where you get your rice, your sardines, your corned beef. No, not corned beef. Corned beef hash. Corned beef hash. And chili con carne, whatever. Those are the regular. It's like we couldn't goods. get enough. We Canada. would go. Okay, From you go to that one. One house to, to another one. one. I go to that one. And I'm pretty sure we had you you know, know. those baul, those big boxes like that, full of rice already. And we had stacked up. And my aunt said, no, that's enough. You don't have to go to the Pico anymore. We have enough. And you know, I think the, Amer uh, the Americans knew. You. The Americans knew that we were cheating, you know. <laughs> but they didn't mind because they knew we were hungry. You know, that was the beauty with America. They knew we were hungry. And they didn't the mind food us. The came first. Boy, but, boy, I tell you. Preserved they saw butter. us they, We would line up here and we would line up to the next Pico and get as many as we can. And I, I, we were so starved for food. They, they knew we were hungry. That's why they didn't mind. They didn't mind. They didn't call our attention. There was no when, drinking water. They would put up huge uh, canvas, canvas tanks. Canvas tanks, yeah. And we had to go there to <laughs> get, get your water, water, yeah. And then they would come back. Oh, you know who's manning those tanks now? He's good looking. He's oh, yeah, okay, let's go get water again. So <laughs> <laughs> chatting there with you. It was really fun. We had fun. I work. I work as an orderly. Sixty at General Hospital. It was just our school. They converted it into a General Hospital, San Beda, and Holy Ghost combined was the Sixty General Hospital, and I became the orderly for the officers, and that's where I got my first job. Oh, it was fun. Okay, we're all done. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Oh. Okay.